Hey folks, this is Emily. I wanted to check in with you because I'm going to be away for a while. I'm having surgery next week. I'll be out of touch for a couple of weeks after. As I get ready for that, I've been working to get state level climate forecasts ready to go. The content should keep dropping until I'm back, but I won't be responding to questions or comments or emails while I'm out. So please excuse the delay in advance. As I prepare for my surgery, emotionally, I'm, I'm a wreck. I'm like a werewolf on crank. It's not great. And that's not for any rational reason. I mean, you know, rationally, the situation is I have serious health stuff. It's been going on for more than a year. We know it's probably wrong with me. The procedure's likely to fix it. Probably I'll recover and I'll feel better. Assessing a situation rationally is important. I try to assist situations rationally, but like every person, the emotional stuff can be difficult. You know, I read the news. I spend a lot of my working time combing through local climate data. As you might imagine, none of that is exactly a soothing or reassuring reality backdrop, especially because you might have noticed, too, there's been a real intensification of the apocalyptic energy online with the geopolitical situation and, of course, the climate data coming in. So I thought, let's take a look at some of the scariest stuff I've seen over the last couple of weeks. Have we gone over a tipping point? Is AMOC collapse happening now? Let's look. Let's look at some stuff. Okay. First off, a lot of people are freaking out over the winter storm systems we've been having this January. Not just because they've been, you know, pretty wild. You can look at some of the shorts I put up recently. I've got eight foot drifts of snow on my property. It's very unusual for the region. I can walk on top of them like an elf, which I do like that. Across the country, these storms have not been as amusing as they've been by me. There have been a tragic loss of life, highway deaths, tornado deaths. But this, this is a thing that got some real play. We saw quite a few people passing around this article in the conversation by Professor Matthew Barlow. This is a great climate scientist talking about why you do still expect to see extreme cold events in a warming world. And it had this image that I saw a number of places on the internet showing that the polar vortex as of January 16th, 2024, had clearly split into two. And a lot of people I know were like, I caught the fever a little. It made me scared too. But like after half an hour of eating chips, I was like, is this rational behavior? So I did a little thinking. I'd like to take a minute to remind everyone this has happened before. This here is just one example of other times where we have had split vortices. This is from uh, February of 2018, virtual identical split in the vortices. So we probably got to keep paying the bills for a while, at least on this account. But I don't mean to minimize everything. Earth systems are messed up. Maybe you remember the update I filmed from my creepy basement this past summer because it was too hot to film anywhere else. I introduced this resource from Zach over at NOAA. I love these visualizations of sex. In the summer, there was a very disturbing phenomena. We saw tremendous anomalous ice loss down by Antarctica. You can see here in this yellow line that's just way out of modeling range, that line tells a tragic story. This ice loss had a big impact on penguins. Very few chicks survived this past nesting season. The change in Antarctica is very serious. And looking down, looking at the this anomaly visual here, you can see that while the anomaly was just enormous during the summer, over the winter, it did return closer to normal. It got us kind of back into modelable territory. And so far, we're still in that sort of more modelable territory for 2024. Global sea ice is looking better now than it was looking in the summer. It doesn't look great, but it doesn't look like super, super weird. And I haven't heard that news anywhere. I just know because I look at the visualization. And that's a lesson to me, really. We got to keep an eye on things. We need to not just look from one flashing red light to the next, right? I don't look at the update for this sea ice extent and feel like, oh, problems are solved. But I do see the potential for maybe things to keep chugging along in modelable range. You know, fingers crossed. We need to keep doing that. We need to keep chugging along in modelable range if we're going to believe in the validity of mid-century projections. And we shouldn't just move from one flashing red light to another, but if a signal is going off, you do got to look at it. So let's look at sea surface temperatures. Big thanks to the University of Maine for their work maintaining this valuable resource. There's a lot of different information in here. You can get the link in the video description. You might notice at a glance that sea surface temperatures look terrible. 
So here's the mean highlighted here. We've got the mean from 1982 to 2011. And then let's look at plus two sigma, increase to the two standard deviation line. If you want to think about this in terms of IQ to help the standard deviation make sense to you, the average IQ is 100. The 2SD IQ is more like 130. So that's a smart person, but honestly, normal enough that they're probably not insane. You start getting three, four sigma out, that person is more likely to be nuts. If we look at what's going on up here in your 2024 data, this is five or six sigma above the mean. This is really out there territory. And very concerning, you can see that this difference between the 2023 data and these next highest ones, which we can see 2020 and 2015, another year where we had El Nino activity, the size of the difference, the size of the gap there, it makes you wonder if you're leaving modelable territory. I gotta say it, this is a figure we could look at today and rationally wonder, did we hit a tipping point? It's a story we need to follow, just like how we followed the CEI story. We're in El Nino right now. That could account for some of this enormous deviation in sea surface temperature. But these conditions are genuinely unprecedented, much like the ice conditions we looked at a minute ago. They were genuinely unprecedented. And then we did see a return to modelable territory. So we got to keep an eye on it. We got to keep an eye on it for at least another season or two before we're ready to declare. It's time to stop paying the bills. Hopefully we're not going to be there. And it's important as we're making these sorts of decisions. How far out are we going to look? We got to know what's going on with El Nino. So we got an update today, January 22nd, 2024. We got an update from NOAA. You know, in the summer, I was reasonably concerned that we could be in for the long haul with this El Nino system. They can stay around for two or three years. The last NOAA update we looked at, we were looking at a 60% chance of getting out of that bad hot pattern by spring. And check this out. It is getting better. The odds are improving. 73% chance we're going to be out of El Nino by April. I wanted to show also on page 23 of this report here that the odds of entering a La Nina cycle, a cooling cycle, are actually increasing and look to be going above 60% in the current outlook by August. This feels like we have the possibility of a narrow escape. Hopefully this Earth system outlook will give us the potential to see the sea surface temperatures move back into a more normal modelable range. If these big Earth system indicators move towards modelable range, that doesn't tell us change is no longer a problem. It gives us some rational hope that the models we can use to guide our local preparations will have utility as we approach mid-century. Looking at short range outlook here in the US, there's our newest update. We got a challenging hot dry spring outlook for Michigan and for the Pacific Northwest, extending you can see all the way up into Southern Alaska. This is gonna be more stress, more drying than anyone would want to see in those coastal forests. There's a lot to be concerned about, but short term, I know this isn't going to get the clicks, but I don't see the signs in place that we're going to have a rapid collapse of the climate system. 2024 is going to be a year with bad, weird climate stuff. That's just the truth. But I am now hopeful that it will have a more modelable degree of lousiness than we otherwise might have faced. I think the signs are still in place that building resilience is the best response we have to the changes that are coming. Resilience for the long haul, resilience that's community minded and resilience that keeps an eye on changing conditions. In my personal life, I'm wrestling with a lot of fear lately, and that can make it difficult to do the stuff I need to do to get ready for the challenge I'm facing with my health. It's very easy to get wrapped up in catastrophic thinking. For me, embracing catastrophe would mean that I didn't have to do all the prep work I'm doing for my surgery and recovery. But I think it's likely that avoiding that work in my case here is gonna lead to worse probable outcomes. On the big scale, big picture, it's the same. Things look serious, but there are enough signs in place. We should stay the course. I think the signs are clear. We're flirting with major tipping points in Earth systems. But if we do get out of El Nino this spring, that could be enough. We could keep on chugging along. So keep working. There is hope. You know, I could die on the table, but it's still worth preparing for my most likely future. Large scale and small, that's true on both counts. Large scale and small, I'm wishing you the best. Think a good thought for me if you get a chance. Let's get ready.
Folks, thanks for listening in. And I'd also like to thank all of the donors and volunteers who contribute to American Resiliency. If you are interested in giving, please check out the donation link on our About page on the YouTube channel or go to our website, www.americanresiliency.org. We are a registered 501c3. If you send us direct donations, they are tax deductible. Thanks to the generosity of this community and both funding and time, we've really been able to step up the quality of our videos for these updated forecasts. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for being here with me. Let's get ready together.